But twenty years in the Legion will make a boy a man. Twenty years in the Legion and they will give you land. Twenty years in the Legion you'll always have a home. Twenty years in the Legions of Rome. Welcome, everybody, to the second series of How Shit Works, the show where we look behind the curtains of how things run in Meridiers. I'm one of your, go your hosts, or ghosts, in this case, hosts, uh, Grant Ulrich. I'm a knight, a pelican, and a roll of beer, and I have opinions. Tonight, I'm joined by, holy crap, it's Captain America. No, wait, it's not Captain America. It's just our own sp special, good old regular co-host, Sir Eric. Hi everyone, I'm Sir Eric Martell. I'm a knight and the landed baron. And despite what a highly disreputable poll might have said, the lightest hitting <laughs> knight in Meridiae. On tonight's episode, Chivalry Part 2, this is our first bonus episode where we'll continue discussion from the previous episodes of the period series. This, tonight will be the chivalry. And tonight we'll cover some touchy subjects and bust some myths. Tonight's guests and subject matter experts are two of my favorite Meridian Knights, Sir Manda Leon, affectionately known as the grumpiest knight in all the realm, and Sir Ostrich Dezislavich, who is definitely the hardest hitting knight in tonight's discussion. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. Go, go ahead. I beg to differ. Manda lived in the kingdom that hits harder than we do. Aw. Uh, that was still a Meridian. <clears throat> So, um, yeah. me to introduce myself first, I guess. Uh, I'm Sir Mandon. I'm a retired, uh, mundanely, I'm a retired old uh, army dude. And um, now I teach in high school and have a little fun with the youngins out there. And sometimes wear this outfit just to make them have a little more fun. Uh, I got knighted in uh, 2008, mundane. And um, I was uh, squire to... Um, Oh, I almost said Grant. Oh, man. Help me Gunther? out here. My brain's locked now. Yes, that <laughs> Gunther guy. Oh, Grant. Look, okay. No. Um, <laughs> Sir, Sir Gunther and uh, Duke Olaf from Atlantia laid me over to Sir Gunther and said, hey, take him and teach him the good stuff. So he did that. Yazi. Hey, I'm Sir Yazi, and on formal occasions, I'm Sir Yastar Dzislavich. Nobody wants to deal with Sir Yastar Dzislavich because he actually is official. Uh, Yazi is just what I do. Um, I was knighted in 2012 mundanely, and I enjoy fighting, and let's just do this. <laughs> Welcome to the show, show, fellas. I want to thank you all for joining us. As always, we're lucky to have our, our guests and our co-hosts. And especially our tech crew, they're all awesome. Um, tonight, as always, we have a drinking game. The drink, the words for tonight's drinking game are uh, sponsored by Sir Mandan is flat. Um, by Sir Yastrub has given us sponsor, which will uh, will probably damage me tonight. Um, <laughs> and Eric has chosen prowess because you know he hates me. All right, so you're welcome to drink with us or not, as you choose. You don't your drink doesn't have to be alcoholic. It can be just water if you if you want. But if you want to drink alcohol, that's perfectly fine. It is not required. For the record, I'm drinking uh, again rum and coke tonight because uh, I try not to change for 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 the week. As always, uh, we'd like to thank Between Two Peers for allowing us to become a licensed franchisee of their drinking game. It's get, brought a lot of fun to this particular show. All right, folks, so we're just going to dive right into this. Unlike our uh, our first shows for each of the periods, we're not going to go over the set questions, but we're going to just dive in right into some of the touchy and pointy and maybe even controversial subjects that we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm lucky enough to get to choose the, uh, the first of the questions. And so I'm just going to go right in on this and say the first myth we're going to talk about or truth, depending on what your answers are, is 
if you miss a shot, get a reputation as thick, you can never recover from that. True or false? Yazi? Well, you can recover. I mean, now it's a long process. It depends upon how often and how long and how many shots you miss. If you miss one shot, nobody's going to say, or we all miss a shot or two. But if it's something to where, and it's also when you miss a shot. If you miss shots all over the place, it's a thing. If you're always missing that shot in the semifinals, then you start getting that reputation. And once you get a reputation, you know, perception is reality. And you got to work real hard to get rid of that perception. It's not impossible, but you're going to have to be good. Um, as my knight used to say, uh, throw the lightning and call the wind. Man. Yeah, sorry about if I have a lag out here. I've got I'm out in the country and I got crappy old uh, uh, internet here. But yeah, pretty much the same thing. If if you look at somebody and they're continually being <clears throat> thick, then one of the challenges that we we want to do is we want to talk to those folks and say, hey, you might want to stop and do this. But what Yazi said, you know, I I will take as if you can hit me as light as can be and you beat me past my defense, I'm going to call it. And I've had people tell me, no, don't call that. And I'm like, uh, no, I didn't defend at all. I didn't block squat and you whacked me good. So I'm going to call it and go from there. So going to chime in on this too. This is quickly going to turn into four nights talking about each of these subjects, which is perfectly fine. Um, Will missing, like Yazi said, will missing a shot or two hurt you? No, unless they're always, unless it always happens at the most fortuitous time, right? Um, but I don't think that's really, really, really an issue. When when we talk about someone who has a calibration issue, is they always have a calibration issue. Is their throwing calibration higher than their receiving calibration, right? That's an issue. And what fixes a lot of that is, is, is talking and conversations and fixing that 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 having that discussion on the field before you leave the field, because that's where you fix it. Once you've left the field, you're, you're accepting what the situation is. Um, but if it's a problem and people have talked to you about it, the last answer we want to hear from you when, when, when three or four nights tell you you have a calibration problem is no, I don't. Because if we, if someone tells you that, especially if the chivalry tells you that, we're not doing it out of spite or out of meanness. We're doing that to try to fix you because if we if we didn't care, if if it was wasn't something that we were worried about, if we didn't want to make to help you, we wouldn't tell you. We would just keep hitting you, and that's not what we do. So yes, you can you can absolutely recover as long as you're as long as you're trying to fix it, and you make a valid effort. If you're contrite every time you're talked to, but you don't fix it, then you're not fixing the problem, right? Or if you're better for that day, but the next the next day, next event, you're back to where you were before, then you're not fixing it. And sometimes it's an armor issue. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes, you know, when you bend your knee that your 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 thigh armor comes away from your from your leg. Um, when you get hit in the in the body armor, uh, it pushes it down in, into the top of your butt so that you feel like you've, got, you've been hitting the leg. These things can be fixed. And those things are never considered an issue. That's just an armor, an armor issue that, that can, be, can be fixed as long as you're willing to try. Or learn how to, how to call, call a shot, given that. Uh, Duke Kaspar famously, if you hit him in the, in the placard, he could never feel it because it sat this far away from his stomach. You know? And so if it hit there, he just didn't know. He just called by sound. I had the same problem with my Russian helmet. Anything above the ears, turns out it's designed to do that. So if you hit me anywhere here and up, I'm just going to call it. And somebody will go, are you sure? I'm like, nope, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I let them know. I like to sort of piggyback off of this for just a second and talk about a thing that's entirely related to the calibration issue. And that is our conversation about calibration. Oftentimes, a fighter will ask his opponent about a shot that they had been struck with. And 
the fighter will say it's fine that, that, that they didn't that it wasn't good even though they think it's good because they think they need to say that to be polite or to not cause waves and then they walk off and they're like man i can't believe he didn't take that you have to trust yourself and your opponents and if you if you were asked and your your opponent asked if a shot was good you have to be willing to say yes i think it was good if you do in fact what you can't do is say one thing and then walk up the field and say another Tandem with that is if you ask someone about a shot and they give you an answer, you have to take that because you already told them you don't know. Yep. Yep. A couple of quick comments from the from the live feed that kind of fit in here. Uh, His Grace Bruce says, or if they always have an explanation why shots aren't good. Um, that's certainly a, an, an issue. Um it's one of the things uh, I remember doing pickups with someone and he kept hitting me in the head, but every time he would hit me in the head before the shot, he would turn the shot in. I'd hit him in his, in his forearm. He had nice stain, uh, spring steel band braces on. They were, they looked beautiful and over and over and over again. And he's like, why are you letting me continue to hit, hit you in the head? I said, because about half a second before you throw that shot, I'm hitting you in the arm. He said, no, you're not. And then I said, well, we looked at his band brace and they were like, four marks across the band brace where, I, where I'd been hitting him. Because plate works. Plate works really well against steel weapons. It works amazingly against a, a rattan round stick. So yeah, you, you have to know your armor. Um, and Sir Colin McDell says, no, no shame in telling an opponent, I'm having a calibration problem and I'm trying to fix it. Please help me. Yeah. All right. Did we cover everything on that one? I think we get it. You want to go ahead with the next one, Ulrich? Sure. So this is this one is my one of my personal favorites. <clears throat> uh, one of my opinion, one of the topics is part of the problem in people not understanding what is required to be a knight is the criteria varies across the known world. There are a lot of shows going on right now. They're talking about what it takes to be a knight, and every one of those shows, including this one, will have a bent on it. A, regarding what kingdom the people in that on that show are from. If you're watching a show in, in the West Kingdom, it's going to have what the people in the, the chivalry in the West look for when they are when they are polled or when they are uh, when they give counsel to their crown as to what defines a knight for their defines a knight. In Meridies, we did, we have that same criteria. Um, so there's a there's a statement that's you know we're all knights of the SCA and that is very true, and this is a controversial one because I'm of a, a slightly different opinion than a lot of people. I, I certainly believe that we are not all knights of the SCA, but what that means you know but we are also knights of Meridias and they are knights of the West and they are knights of Kai and they are knights of Kalantir in the mid realm, and I say that because when you are brought up in an area. Or when you're you are knighted in an area, you are knighted to that kingdom's requirements under what corpora says. And the discussions that we'll have here in a knight circle are different than the, the discussions that other kingdoms kingdoms will have. Some put a higher value on prowess. Some make sure they're more rounded. Um, yeah, well, we were like 15, ten minutes into the show, and no one no one had said any of the words yet, so. I'm a firm believer that you are a knight of your kingdom and that, but you, that rank of chivalry is something or KSCA or MSCA is something that's recognized around the, around the known world. Um, whereas some people say that, you know, we're knights of, of, of the SCA and we happen to live in a certain kingdom, but I, I can guarantee you that if I went to the West kingdom that I, I would have gotten knighted. I don't know that. I, you know, I certainly don't know if someone had, had, had moved here from Ethelmark that they would have met our standards a, as quickly as they met them there. Would they have gotten there, gotten there? Would I have gotten there? Probably eventually, but the speed may not have been the same. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. This isn't really a question. It's more of a, give me your ideas on, on this subject. Hell, I don't think you have four people in this room that'll agree on exactly the criteria because I can pretty much guarantee you that I put more 
emphasis on melee fighting than other people do. I'll be honest, if you don't fight melees and you don't, you know, excel on the field of tournament and on the war field, that's that's just not what I think is well rounded. Right. But you know, when we when we go to Calentier at Lilies, yay Lilies, love Lilies. Yeah, the yeah. pickup fighting is a little different, but man, the war fighting is intense. So they're, you know, what they're looking for is a little different than what we're looking for. And since their process is different, the whole thing's very different. So the whole the whole night of this, night of that, yeah, you I think you would have you have, wherever you go, you have to adjust to what you're doing when you get there. But yeah, you certainly have a bent from where you were knighted. Yeah, I have a. I guess I I got started in the S, in the SCA back in 1988, and they handed us this little piece of paper that was I don't know printed on one of those crazy old things we had in high school, and it talked about being knighted and all the the list of things, the whole you know play chess and dance and all this kind of stuff. But when I looked at any of the folks after I was knighted, I started looking at folks. One of the things I looked for was do they do fighting in all areas are they if they're just doing on the field or are they doing in a tournament you know so if the melee if they only do melee but they don't do tournament or if they just do tournament and don't do melees can we work on getting them to do both because to me a knight is supposed to be able to teach and lead within all of those areas plus i also also looked at, at them and said you know if i know they may not be artsy but do they support art do we only see them at a fighting event or can can do they go to arts events just to learn stuff or the support folks? And the same thing with service, because I look at them and I go, are they serving the kingdom by just washing dishes if need be or moving stuff or whatever? Other than just going out to the field, coming out, putting armor on, going out in the field and then leaving right afterwards. Are they actually staying there doing all those other things? So to me, it's not just, you know. Some kingdoms may be doing just the fighting source source of that, but I was sort of pulled into you've got to do more to be knighted, and that's what I kind of expect when I look for some a squire. Eric, you have an opinion? No, that one I don't even want to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, right, right quickly before Eric gets to, to his next question, um, there was something that we didn't, in the first episode, we didn't read. Um, and if, unfortunately, it's not following me to read it, so you guys will have to put up with my minorly dys dyslexic ability to read. So we, we covered, uh, in each of the period shows, except for the chivalry, the requirements from Corpora for that specific order. Um, in the chivalry show, we we covered what, what the requirements for... Um, all of the peerages, which included the being well-rounded, service, arts, fighting. Um, but so in the in Corpora section eight four A, the chivalry, it says the chivalry consists of two equal parts, the knighthood and the master of arms. No one may belong to both parts of the order at one time. When a member is admitted to the chivalry by the sovereign, the choice of which part of the order to join is made by the new member. The candidate must be considered the equal of his or her prospective peers, prospective peers, <clears throat> sorry, with the basic weapons of tournament combat. To become a knight, a candidate must swear fealty to the crown of his or her kingdom during the knighting ceremony. Masters may choose to swear fealty where you're not required to do so. And then it goes into a list of duties. But those are the, the requirements to become a knight. So when people talk about, you know, what's required by corpora, there's the portion under peerage, which talks about, you know, you should, should know how to do a dance, should know uh, the courtly graces, essentially do service in, in, in arts and support the arts. And then it talks about those. Um, and it doesn't say specifically, it doesn't say you have to fight in tournaments. It says you have to be the equal to, <clears throat> sorry, make sure I get this right. The equal his or her prospective peers in the basic weapons of tournament combat it doesn't say you have to fight in tournaments. It says you have to be the, the equal with those weapons. 
Just saying. For people who say you have to fight in tournaments, there's that. People who say you have to fight in wars, there's that. I think it's, I personally think it's the ability to use those in either situation, right? All right, Eric, what you got? All right. So, so when I first saw this, this is a two part question. And when I saw the first part, I thought that's one of the stupidest things I've ever read. So I want to handle that now because it's so stupid, it actually is stunning. The first part is apparently someone somewhere believes that knights get together and discuss who's going to get knighted among men at arms and then give only those guys squires belts. Okay, right. <laughs> I realize the insanity of what I just said. I didn't make that question. Somewhere out there, there's someone with a tinfoil hat that thinks that. The second part of the question, though, is, is a real question and something we can discuss. And that is that knights only give squires belts to people they think can actually get knighted. What do you think of both of those statements, gentlemen? Well, I actually think that if anyone wants to get out there and do what they need to do to learn to fight well, and they're, then anyone could be knighted, so to speak. So it's one of those, no, I, I didn't take any of my squires just because I thought they could be knighted so I could stand up and go, oh, all my squires are being knighted. No, no. No, I did it because I love them and I wanted to see them move on through and to build up um, more into it. But I also wanted to be there to support them as they were growing within the fighting so that they could be knighted down the road. Um, it was, wasn't just because I thought they would be knighted. Um, I, I teach school for a living. I mean, I'm, I'm a teacher. If I didn't think students could, could succeed, I'd be pretty crappy at my job. But so I don't have any squires that I don't think have no ability to get knighted. Now, let's face it, the clock is not the bit friend of everybody. And statistics just show most people are not going to get knighted. And I have squires that, I mean, let's face it, their, problem, their path is such that they may wind up in another peerage long before they come up in our circle. That's not to disparage them as fighters. They're just... I happen to have a household that I feel very strongly about service and art. And it turns out I have people that are good at that. And two of them have a very influential Laurel who uh, will whip them into shape. And, you know, they're, they're actually very well, very far along that path. And, you know, that's to say if they get a Laurel they, that they don't, they won't get knighted, they'll need a sponsor. Tricky bastard. <laughs> but I didn't take them into my household because I thought they're guaranteed to be a knight. God, nobody is guaranteed to be a knight. Because, I mean, even Caspar, if he'd come out six months in and blew out an ACL and never could walk again, he wouldn't have got knighted. And that guy was a monster the second he stepped on the field. Stupid tall people. Stupid tall people. <laughs> oh, Rick. You have an opinion on this? Oh, I, I have an opinion on everything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is my shocked face. <laughs> <laughs> so, first off, the whole concept that all of us get together and decide who, who as, a, as a group, who we're going to give belts to, give Squires belts to. I only have one word to say to that is, ha! Huh? That's right. some bullshit. <laughs> that's that's some that's some 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 smoking the good stuff there. I I don't know where that came from, um, but no. As for as for only giving giving belts as an individual to people that we think can be can be knighted, that's up to every individual knight, right? Some people aren't going to put that. You know, if, if they're a highly charged individual and they're only going to train someone they think has the, the potential to be a member of the chivalry, that's, that's their choice. But there's, you know, that if that's the case, there may not be, may not be a good fit for that, for the, the squire that's looking at them anyway, unless that's their, unless that's their drive. You have to be a highly driven squire to meet that, that kind of Knights criteria. I mean, it's just one of those things. Um, I don't think, any of us give belts, anyone that I know give belts to, to anyone who that we don't think can be chivalrous. And 
that's the thing. It's not about it's not about making the waypoint to uh, of, of knighthood or of chivalry um, and receiving the accolade. It's about walking the path. And I think most of us consider that in the in the prospective candidate um, when we when we look at them. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially here in Meridies, you know, a new fighter shows up, you know, and shows any kind of talent. And, you know, the knights start circling or because we all, all, it's all we have here is knights. The knights start circling like vultures. Ooh, was that a flat snap? <laughs> for real, guys, give them a chance. Let them right. germinate Ooh. for a second. Oh, wait, it's a lefty. <laughs> you know, get, right. give, you know I, I personally ha have, an, have a rule of I'm not going to take any squire, anyone as a squire who hasn't been in for at least a year because they should have a chance to learn about the SCA. But I have a, no, I have a rule no, that I, right. I rule that even after we start talking and they express an interest, I take them as a man at arms for a year yeah, just to make sure absolutely. that we can stand each other. Uh, the best piece of advice my night Baldy ever gave me was think about the worst day you've had recently where everything's gone to shit and you go home and there's this squire wanting to talk to you about fighting. Can you talk to that person? Oh, that's great. Great advice. So I'm, probably a little further along, I think, than my brothers here. I'll be honest. If I don't think you can reach the prowess level to be recognized as a member of the chivalry, I, I won't square that person. And I don't think it's, and I don't think it's a, a bad statement on that person. I'd be glad to have them in my household as a man at arms. Because I do very much care what type of person they are. I just feel like, for me, when I'm taking a squire, I'm saying to this person, I'm going to try to teach you everything that I know about fighting and teach you everything I know about being a knight, which is admittedly not that much. And But that I believe that at least on prowess level, you will be able to reach that. All right, guys. That word <laughs> is the least important part of what makes you a knight. I just need to believe you can get there. All right. So I'm going to go off script here for a second because I love to do that. No. So I know, right? It's not, it's not on this list. Sorry, sorry Jess. <laughs> um, so... We used to have a, a, a knight that lived here, um, um, Morgan Olander, um, went off, became a duke in, in, in North Shield, uh, affectionately known as Asshole Morgan, um, not to be confused with Tourette's Morgan, which is Morgan Ironheart. Um, but he had a he had a great statement. I don't know where he got it, but I heard it first from him. Prowess is the vessel in which you pour your peer like qualities, your chivalric, chivalric virtues. If you have just, if you just have prowess, then you have a cup that's empty. If you just have chivalric virtues, then you have all of your liquid all over the table and nothing to hold it in. So that's how we build a night, right? Is you fill a cup, you fill your cup of prowess with the cheval with, with the knightly virtues and the chivalric virtues, and in the end of that is a knight. Now, how much of each virtue goes in in that cup is a different story. Or to to, to, to quote Duke, Duke Phelan, I don't care if he's Jesus. I'm sorry, hold on. I don't care if he's Jesus Christ. If he can't fight, I ain't gonna knight him. If he can't swing a stick, I ain't voting for him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, you take the next one. Still my favorite class of all time. Yep. Dirty tricks and gray areas of SCA combat. All right, hey, so <laughs> I owe you guys three drinks. All right, so here's my here's my my myth. Getting a, a pelican, a laurel, or a court barony means that you will never get knighted. Whiskey Tango Fox trot over. I, I've heard it said, I've heard someone told, they got their court bearing, they walked out, someone gave them a hug and said, well, I guess that's the end of your road. 
You'll well, now when I got in, in, the court barony was, I was informed the court barony back in the day was what you gave to somebody that, hey, you know, we like you, we love you, you're just never going to make that peerage, here you go. Now, since then, it has certainly changed because, you know, court barony is given to people that are, you know, peered less than a year after that. <laughs> So that's certainly not the case now. And I, I don't I don't care if you're where a pelican, a laurel, a master of arms. I, I don't care what you are. If you can swing a stick, if you're not a bad person and you have franchise, what the hell? I'll vote for you. Uh, so I'll poll for you, sorry. But I mean, it just, I, I don't give a, <laughs> I, I don't understand why, why being a pelican would keep you from being knighted. I mean, if somebody beat my ass, whatever they're wearing, they're beating my ass. But, you know, I, and, and I'm looking at it, like I said before, I, I look for folks, you know, when I'm, when we're sitting in the circle and one of the things I'll ask a lot, and these guys could probably say that I've asked it probably maybe too, too many times <laughs> is, are they supportive of arts? Are they supportive of service? Do they do anything? So, I mean, if you got a pelican, obviously they meet the service side of my brain and if they're a laurel they meet the artsy side of my brain at least so there's no reason why they wouldn't if they like i said if they're out there and they're whooping our heinies and they're doing it with honor then there's no reason why we wouldn't knight them yeah, they've already proven they've got those quote peer like qualities mm -hmm. i mean <laughs> that takes the part of it the yeah can they can fight but you know Pardon the phrase. Are they a dick? Well, that, that answers that portion, you know. Eric, got an opinion? <laughs> I know you do. But look, if you listen to nothing else I say all night, <laughs> whatever you do or don't have, in terms of awards, doesn't matter at all. At any level, the end. No one cares. We, have, we each have our standards. You either meet them for that individual member of the order, or you don't. But no one cares what awards you have, or don't have. The end. Well, that kind of leaves like that one before. <laughs> I think there was another myth that you had mentioned before about something. If you don't do this, you don't do that, and you'll never do them. You know, it's one of those. But yeah, we've got we've got uh, more of them. But yeah, those you know, court baronies, other awards are not consolation prizes. There used to be a consolation prize. It was called the guide on. They closed that. It's just you reopened it for like seven minutes. <laughs> I, I did reopen it for seven minutes because I made a stupid stupid promise as a squire. If you make promises, keep your promises. <laughs> Even if they're stupid. But there are no cons consolation prizes. That's not how that. That's not how that works. I think you're up, Eric. All right. So I'm going to go with a question, or rather, a myth that's so wrong, it's going to get busted immediately, and we're just going to move on to the next one. But this myth is: you have to be voted in unanimously. You, guys want to <laughs> you stunned us all into silence <laughs> other than laughing um let's see i've been a knight about eight years now uh, there's always somebody that that will help you that I don't, I don't know if anybody except for maybe one person that's ever been unanimous and even then, we had somebody that was going to vote no just so it wouldn't be unanimous. <laughs> so I've been, that's, that's crazy. And again, the four of us don't necessarily agree on what we consider the, the bar exactly, much less 40 grumpy, eight personal, eight type personalities sitting in a room. God. I mean, and don't we have. <laughs> Don't we have rules of what it takes to be voted in? So that doesn't say unanimous. It's weird. If you just read, you can see that that doesn't happen. 
We do. This is an old one. Um, this is an old, old uh, myth that apparently happened a long time ago. Uh, now, I, I think I may know where this came from. Uh, the Sable Sword used to have a un unanimous polling requirement, and it really wasn't unanimous. It was you could blackball somebody. In other words, if if you didn't vote yes, you, it, that was fine. But if anyone was a hell no, they could they could keep someone out for a while. But that was fixed when people find out about it, essentially, because that's just bullshit. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, that's the only place I can think of that, that where that came from. Sorry, I, I just read. Uh, I, I missed until now um, Jess's response to me going off script a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, I, that was classic. <laughs> Unfortunately, those who you're watching will never know exactly how hysterical it was. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that you were right, Eric. We went through that one pretty quick. So we'll, I'll hit I'll hit this with another short one, and I want Yaza to answer this first because I, I feel like. Uh, <laughs> not, that's not, it's, it's not aimed. At, no, it's not aimed at him. It's, it's aimed at someone who was knighted up where he was, uh, where he lived when he got knighted, which was, we'll, we will never knight someone for war fighting. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 not true. I mean, I was knighted in 2012, and there are some people that feel that my war fighting was a, a large factor in my getting knighted. Now, again, I wasn't at that meeting. I don't know. I don't need to know. Don't want to know. Um, but I will certainly say that that is not the case, that I certainly feel that someone can get knighted. Now, you have to be able to fight. You have to be able to fight with weapons and tournament. I mean, that, that's by Kapora what you have to do. Does that mean you have to hit 30 tournaments a year? No, but that means you need to be proficient and skilled in those weapon types. So that's just total crap. I mean, that's totally not the case. And I, and I, I agree with that. I mean, if you're on the field and you're kicking butt, mostly on the field, you're kicking butt. And then, but you get on the field and get on the tournament field and we all go, oh crap, we're going to get whacked by this guy. And he's going to beat every defense I've got. That doesn't mean if you're doing more war, but you only do a couple of tournaments, that, that doesn't matter. You're still, you know, making us go, wow, that guy has some good um, P word. I'm going to say the full P word because well, prowess. What the heck? Prowess. Prowess. <laughs> Embrace it. And that's, and that's kind of the way I look at it, too. But. Same thing if you're on the tournament field. If you're just doing all tournaments and whatnot, but eventually you go on the field, on the the melee field, and and you someone goes, "Whoa, <laughs> he's kicking everyone's hiney on that bridge." Well, guess what? It's because he's a good fighter. He knows skill, and he can use a spear, a spear, or he can use a sword and shield. You know. And you can use your melee fighting to actually catch the attention of knights to start w watching how you fight on the tournament. Because man has got a pretty good story where I caught his attention on the melee field with that dude that didn't want to call shots. <laughs> that was so good. I love that basketball or that baseball shot you threw. That was awesome. Right. You know, you get to call you when you want. And I've got a seven and a half foot stick. <laughs> light, light. <laughs> There's no light, light excessive. <laughs> That's the SCA definition of whining is light, 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 light excessive. You got an opinion, Eric? Yeah, I actually do. So, <laughs> why is it always me? All right. So, I, in general, agree with my brothers. But that said, one, if you just war fight, you'd better be Achilles. You're not Achilles. That's a once in a lifetime thing. If you only tourney fight, same principle for me. I don't care how good you are. You don't do the other. You're going to have to be amazing for me to poll positively for you. Because I expect you to do both. And I expect you to have a higher level of prowess with both. So for my poll, you could get in only war fighting. 
you would have to be amazing constantly on the war field. That's all I got. All right. So there are there are reasons where I will forgive someone who doesn't fight melees if they have a medical issue, if they have a bad knee or something where you know they, they just can't take the, the charge or whatever. I can understand that. Um, and I, I can give a pass for that. I've been in conversation with people who are like, oh, well, so-and-so is a great tourney fighter, but you know, they're, you know, they're, they're crap on the war field. I'm like, really? Have you ever s- watched them on the war field? Because I've never seen a good, a really good tourney fighter who cannot be a force on the melee field because it's, it's how you use them, right? Are they amazing in a line? No, probably not. But if they're an amazing sword and shield fighter, but they're not getting the line, I can probably put them out, out on an edge as a, as a as a flanker and use them in that way, or the dangle the duke concept or something, um, where you you know, where you put them put them in that situation. Now the person they were talking about at the time was Gareth, and I thought that they were stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that atomic bomb had no value on the battlefield, right? <laughs> um, but the, the same, same thing goes with, with, with war fighters. Now I have seen war fighters who aren't, who I didn't think were good in tourney fights, but that's because they never fought in tourney fights, but you catch them on the pickup field and, and fight them one-on-one there to, to test them. And you go, Oh, okay. Their prowess is there. It's just, they don't like tournaments, but you better, be, but like Eric said, you better be an amazing on that. And you're going to have to show me, that you can do the individual stuff and that you're not just a spear God or, you know, if you're just a glaive God, that's fine, but you better be a glaive, a glaive God in individual combat too. And if you don't want to fight in tournaments, that's fine, but you, be, you, be, you better show me that in, in pickups. And that's where NGT was really helpful to me because it allowed me to get that one-on-one great weapon love and doing some stuff. That was a lot of fun for me. And, and that's what, why I like some of our high profile tournaments because everybody gets to see them. You don't have to fight at MGT, but it certainly makes life easier or going to tournaments where you can be seen. Because ultimately, I mean, no, you don't have to fight in tournaments, but we have to know who you are. Right. Right quick, I want to I want to say something to those people that, that said that, you know, they're pretty sure you got knighted because of your war ability. I, I am going to point out that you were in the Sable, are in the Sable Sword which you get into for tur- tournament fighting, just for the record, just going to point out <laughs> people because you, ha- you, you you do have prowess, asshole. All right, Eric, you're up. Oh, damn. Oh, wait. oh, so this is the favorite one for me. You have to win tournaments before you will get knighted. The corollary of this question is, you have to consistently win tournaments to meet prowess standards. Right? How do you gentlemen feel about that? Well, the, the concept that you have to win tournaments all over the place is just ridiculous because you can be a superb fighter and not win tournaments because I was traveling for a while and every tournament I turned around at, there was – Gunther and there was Baru and there was Bryce and I'm like I'm expected to win one of these tournaments you know and then anything up in Tennessee Alanon was there yeah because we're all beating Alanon so the the concept you have to win the tournaments because I've had tournaments where I went two and out that I felt pretty good about the day and there's tournaments where I went four or five in and went I didn't fight anybody so the concept that you have to win tournaments is just ridiculous because, I mean, let's face it. If you're in a group that has Alanon, Seth, Baru, Bryce, Gunther, insert other royal peer, man, that's going to be a hard day to try and win those tournaments. I'd No offense, but I went up to Danny DeWitt and they, were, they didn't have any nights at the time. And I went through one of their tournaments and won the tournament and did not feel as good as I did at the Dreamstone where I beat Max in the semis. I would, you know, hell, I was happy for a year after beating Max because that guy just scares the crap out of me because he hits hard. Oh, wait. Hey, Eric. I'll take my money for saying that now. (laughs) 
Well, I agree. All right, I mean, Amanda, what you got? Well, I wasn't. I, I won. I won W O N one O N E tournament before I was knighted. And I, I was really thinking about that when I was a squire. I was like, man, I got to win a tournament. But when I got out there, I'm said, I'm not going to do anything that's against that. You know, my my honor to to win. And if someone's better than me, they're going to kick my hiney. And they did. But I think when we look at folks out there, even if they don't win a tournament, is how did they fight in the tournament? Did they fight with honor in that tournament? Did they fight with it that the prowess? <clears throat> I'll say it anyway. Did they fight using different weapons if, if they want to go through that process? And and that's where we look at it. Again, I only won one tournament before I I got some cool chairs out of it, and it was a novice tournament. But it was not novice, but un, unbelted tournament. But it's one of those things that I think that we just need to we focus on actually how they do in the fight. It has nothing to do with whether you win or not. All right, thoughts? Um, be competitive. If you make me work, if you make me consider you. So I, I used to say this, uh, I used to say this about wars and it's, it's still true. I know that you are on my radar. Uh, when I was in the bear, I used to say, I know that the person's on my radar in a war. If I'm lining up the two sides and I look across the field and I go, oh crap, Yazi's over there. He's on my radar, right? That's that. That was my that was my line as a bear for the bear. It, you know, if I'm going into a tournament and I'm like, shit, Mandon, I'm have to make. I mean, you know, I have to make it past Mandon. Where is he in, in in the list? When I get in there, when I get in the tournament, I'm I'm figuring out who my challenges are along the way, right? I'm figuring you. Know, I'm figuring out what you know who I'm gonna have to deal with as the tournament goes on. Now, once the tournament starts, I'm focused on whoever I fight next. But as the as we're as we're setting up our stuff, and I'm seeing who's arriving that day, I'm figuring out who the, who the contenders in the tournament are going to be. It's just the, the way it is. If you're on that list, if 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 you're making the knights worry about you in the tournament, then you're on your way. Um, I don't think winning. You know, sure, winning tournaments is good because I like to know who who drinks coffee and who doesn't because coffee's for closers, but. It's not required. Does it help? Absolutely. But like Yazi said, it also it also matters how difficult that tournament was. Did you win a did you win a tournament with six guys in it? Okay, who were those guys? Who were those people? Who were those who were those combatants? You know, because if you went if you, you know if you went to a to, to a tournament with Caspar and, and Angus and won that, then all right, that says something. You know. And it's, it's, it's renown. That's how renown works. You, you, you want to earn renown, beat people. You know, beat people who who have renown. So, unsurprisingly, I am a little to the to the uh, to the right here um, with my brothers. I agree in principle, and so, and because this question has two parts, or this myth rather has two parts, I think this is important. You do not consistently have to win tournaments. Because let me be clear, there are very few people in this kingdom who consistently win tournaments. Very few. But if you've been hard charging, fighting a lot all over the kingdom, and at some point you didn't win something, I'm not going to say I would automatically pull against that candidate, but it would say something to me. I'll admit that because as you say, there are a whole lot of tournaments that we have. Some of them are highly competitive and some are less so. And if you haven't wandered into one or a few of those at some point in your SCA fighting career and come out the victor, it makes me wonder why. Uh, just as a show of hands, how many of the people in this conversation won a tournament before they were knighted? Just one. Uh, and you won one. So that's all of us. I, 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 I had to drive to I had to drive to BFE uh I had to drive to BFE uh 
Louisiana to, to get my first one. But you you were the king of BFE Louisiana. No, so, it, was, it was a novice tourney. It was, it was a, a bridesmaid. So no one in the tournament had won one before. All right. Did you win <laughs> one after that before you were knighted? Ooh, yeah, but that's not. The point. All right. That, that, that's my point. That was that was my point. I, I, again, I'm not saying I think that's a deal breaker of any sort. It just makes me wonder. Now, and, to be fair, I, I one, the, the answer. Now, the on the other end of that, though, winning, but they didn't you, actually win. You know, they get the second or third place, and they get knocked out by Duke, Duke, Dukey, Duke, 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 and they're going, well, right. he got all the way up there and got knocked out by you know the guy who's been king sixteen times. So, yeah, I want to know that too. Jade doesn't live here. <laughs> well, again, also, I, it depends upon where you lived to get one, sort of out of well, one of those out of the way tournaments. See, anyway, because again, some of those small tournaments in the Atlanta area might have two dukes in it. Right, that's completely fair. Now, having All said right, that, so. yeah, I've definitely wandered into some of the smaller stuff. But again, you know, it's where who you run into a tournament with. Yeah, I spent right. I spent the the better part of uh, let's let's say let's just say I spent the, spent the better part of ten years writing the events with Caspar. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so speaking of depending on where where you live, you can't get knighted if you live if you live on the coast or in Thor's Mountain or in uh, Savannah. <laughs> so huh. I, I'm just. Is that why you invited us? So you had two Thor's Mountaineers on. <laughs> it former was it's a it's a pleasant uh, pleasant bonus. <laughs> yeah, I got knighted in South Down. So, <laughs> it, I guess if you stay in those places and you never come out, and no one ever sees you there. You might not get knighted, but I mean, you, you can't sit there in Savannah for ten years and just fight there and not come out because no one will ever see you. How do we know who you are? You know, but just because you're there doesn't mean because it's a coastal thing. That has nothing to do with it. If that was if that was the case in Meridiaz, if you were up in uh, in Thor's Mountain, for instance, um, and you don't go anywhere else, guess what? You're not going to get seen. So don't expect to get knighted if no one can else else can see you because you don't have, you don't have to expect the knights to go to Thor's Mountain to see you. You have to go to the seat for them to see you in other places. Um, my night, uh, my first night, Sir Harold Barson, um, he was firmly about me traveling to see people. He would go, get the hell out of East Tennessee, go somewhere where you can fight the big dogs. And, you know, and I was confused because I thought, oh, you know, I'm doing well here. And then I got out of where my my local group, and that was a whole different ball game. And um, again, it's it's about you got you get the renown, I guess, is what you were talking about. It, it's the people knowing who you are, because it's hard to get somebody to to be you know hot on you wanting wanting you to be a knight if they don't know who you are. Now, having said that, we're a big ass big ass kingdom. Because I remember, you know, everybody kept saying, you got to go to Gadlop, you got to go to Gadlop, you got to go to Gadlop. That was a nine and a half hour drive for a weekend event. That's, you know, that's hard on the old budget and the, and the old nerves. Now, being a school teacher in the summer, I hit Arabian Nights pretty much yearly so that those guys would know who I was. Now, your mileage may vary, but, you know, you got to get people to know where you are and who you are and, and so on and so forth. Eric? So I think the question itself is phrased poorly or the myth is wrong, but it points one thing out that I think people should think about, and that's geographic isolation is a thing. If you don't leave your area, you're only going to get so much exposure to other quality fighters. That is going to inhibit your development beyond a shadow of a doubt. The more good fighters that you fight, the better you will become. The more things you will see, the more things you will be able to adapt. So if you just stay in that isolated area, it will inhibit your fighting. 
it's not that people won't pull positively for you because you're from an isolated area, but because you get less exposure to other fighters and it inhibits your own personal development. And that is a thing that happened. Uh, on that note, um, Wolfgang and I, we, we fought a lot. I mean, I don't want to even think about how many fights we've had. But it got to where we would block the next person's shot as they were starting to throw it. And then I would go travel and come back, and I would beat him like a dog for about two fighter practices until he figured out my, figured out my new stuff. And then he would go somewhere else, and he'd come back, and he'd walk my dog for a couple of fighter practices until we figured out. Traveling abroad gives you a different set of fights because – the concept of fighting inbreeding is a thing. So if nothing else, you need to travel just so you can learn new tricks and different tricks and, you know, you know, not just a frame or not just, you know, windshield wiper blocks, et cetera. Are you muted, buddy? I am muted. Thank you very much. I just uh, <laughs> had Alice had sent, I'd sent Katarina to make me another drink because you guys had made me drink all of my booze. Um, <laughs> it's the um, it's the big fi big fish small pond issue, right? If you're in a you know in a local group, it does make it harder. It does make it impossible, but it does make it harder, especially if you don't travel. Um, you get the more you travel, the more you're exposed to to, to better fighters. The more better more fighters and better fighters that you're exposed to the better you'll become um it's just you know, it's just the way it is uh we do have a few good comments in uh in the feed on it um his majesty says uh correlation does not equal cause uh co correlation is not, not equal causation um master edwards says get out get out of your comfort zone um his Grace uh, John the Bear Killer says there are advantages to being closer to larger groups. Does does make does make traveling for those on the outskirts a bit more a, more of a challenge? And I'll add but that it that it's worth it. All right, I think you're up, Eric. All right, so we're gonna the next one we're going to go to is is a little different. Um, and this is, do you have to fight in crown list and or specific tournaments? In other words, I think the, the myth being that if you don't fight in these tourneys, that people won't take you seriously. We're going to com combine that one with you can't get knighted if you don't go to X region or perform well at X event, such as South Downs, Red Tower, et cetera. Because I think those are really the same question. So if you don't either don't travel to certain areas or you don't per perform well in specific tournaments like crown list, for example, or, or, or red tower, then you, you can't get knighted. Well, I'm that goober who didn't fight in any crown list until after I was knighted. And then I didn't fight for the crown, but I fought as a buy because I figured if you're going to be crown, you need to have your buy fights need to be annoying as crap. And that was me. Um, and a few others, there were some other great guys that were annoying in those times. Um, and I only fought one crown list my entire, the entire time I've been in the SCA. So, no, you don't have to. Um, I'm going to jump in here. I have some strong opinions about crown list and fighting a crown list. Um, I know you do. <laughs> well, I mean, being crown is a job and it's a hard damn job. I have been enough entourages that I've seen what being crowned can do to the people that are crowned. I mean, it's it's rough. Um, when this was created, it was actually so that they would find somebody who would you know stop having fun for six months and give out awards. I mean, that that's literally what this was you know designed as. And if you cannot do the job or are not willing to do the job, do not fight in that tourney. Now, if you're in a position to where you can and you know above about the SCA and you think you have something that, you know, you can give to the SCA, go for it. But having said that, nothing. Now, you want to talk about missing a shot and, and screwing up your uh, <laughs> your chances of uh, getting knighted. 
Um, yeah, you blow off a few shots in the crown list wherever God and everybody are watching you. That'll certainly, because I guarantee you that people are recording that. They're watching it over. They're talking about it. Um, they're analyzing that fight six months later. Um, so now, and my, and I have squires that have fought in crown list and I have fired squires that will fight in crown list, but they've been in a position to where financially, and I felt they could do the job if they won. And if they didn't, you know, that's fine. It was, it was, it was a good experience, but I didn't feel they needed to fight in it. Um, and I think you need to be doing it for the right reason to, to fight in crown. If you're doing it because you're mad at Bob and you want to banish Bob, that, that, that's probably not what you want to do because, you know, I mean, as my friend Kenneth says, whenever you're the crown, you make what's called a shit sandwich. And when you step down, you have to eat that sandwich. And I have seen some gigantic poop sandwiches that some crowns had to eat when they stepped down. And it was rough. You, you can ruin your SCA experience by winning that tournament if, you, if, it, if, it, if it gets to you. And I don't necessarily know that it's going to, you know, show that the Knights go, hey, you know, this guy did okay in Crown, we're going to knight him. I mean, I know several people that did okay in Crown List and they had a good day, but they had a good day. It's just one part of your body of work. And just having a good red tower or just having a good MGT is not going to get you knighted. I mean, I... I'm not sure how many times I won the Great Weapons Tournament or it was in the final of the Great Weapons Tournament before I got knighted. I don't know. I don't care. But, you know, me winning one certainly did not immediately get me knighted. So just... It didn't hurt. Well, no, it didn't hurt. But that was because... I mean, don't get me wrong. If you if you do well in a tournament and you fight clean and you fight with the right attitude, yeah, it's, it goes back to that renown. But, you know, I know a guy that... Oh, hell, I'm just going to call him out. He just sticked his way through the Great Weapons Tournament to, to the point to where I had a Rose come over to me and apologize that he had won. And it, it was rough on him. He made it, it set his fighting back for years. Oh, that guy. Yeah, that guy. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> but I, you know, so the concept that a tournament is mandatory is ridiculous. Yep. All right. Um, so I was told multiple times when I was a squire that you, you can't get knighted unless you do well at, at, uh, unless you do well at, at red tower. So, I mean, it was not intentional, but I never went to a red tower until the week after I got knighted. It was that I had planned to go to red tower. I wasn't going because, uh, because of that statement, but red tower had always been against tavern brawl. Tavern brawl was two hours from my house. Red, red tower was at least four. That was why I hadn't gone. Um, and you know, my group generally supported the group that hosted red tower. Um, we kind of worked together on, on a lot of things. So that was why I always went to, to tavern brawl. Um, now when I did manage to go to red, to red tower, I did not, I did not win red tower, but I won the Baron's prize tourney there. So I felt justified. <laughs> um, but no, you don't, you don't have to have to, to have to go to any specific tourneys. Now, can going to certain tourneys and do, doing well help? Absolutely. You have a good day at Red Tower? Absolutely help you. Have a good day in Crownless? Absolutely help you. Win a tourney or do well at MGT? Absolutely. freaking lootly it'll help you. Renown's a thing, right? It's legit. Good renown, bad renown. Renown's a thing. You know, won a rose tourney by, by being thick? Bad renown. Won a rose tourney by being clean? Good renown. <laughs> it all works out, right? Um, but no, you don't have to. You don't have to participate. And as a matter of fact, if I find out on a personal level that you're participating in Crown List just to be seen, it's actually going to count a little against you in, in my world personally. Because there are other places, other places you can fight to be seen. You can go to Red Tower. You can go to MGT. You can go to Black Axe. You can go to some of these other events. And I had a person tell me one time they wanted to fight in Crown List to get people's best. I respected the hell out of that. Now. They may have gotten more than they wanted, <laughs> but uh, they certainly got people's best. So, I'm of the opinion that if you fight in Crown and you aren't prepared to be Crown, you're a moron. Like, if you can't afford it or you're not in the position in life to do it, 
and you fight in Crown List, you're an idiot. You really don't need to fight in any specific tourney at all. Though, as Ulrich said, like if you go to a bigger tourney and you have a good day, or renowned, people are going to see that. I also want to cover one specific tournament really, really clear me clearly. So I want you guys to listen. Those of you who are watching, I want you to look me in the eyes when I say this. You will not get knighted solely because you win Knight's Gambit. We good? All right. Because I hear that garbage a lot. Yep. 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 It is a big tournament with a lot of people watching and it brings out some good sticks. And they're all the knights are watching you for good or bad. Right. <laughs> but if you're winning that and you know, and you're a hot you're a hot stick squire, then it's the tournament you're supposed to win. Show me show me you winning something you're not supposed to win. Now, don't be wrong. It shows me you're not you're not you didn't choke, and it shows me that you know you can win the fight you're supposed to win, and that's a good thing. But sometimes I need to send, see you win the fight you're not supposed to win, too. Right. Um, there's one thing. There's one thing about winning tournaments, though. It doesn't necessarily mean that you come in at the very end that you beat everybody, but you win the tournament when you walk off that field with honor, and you show people that you can actually fight. To me, that's winning the tournament. So I guess, hopefully, every tournament I've ever been in, I've won in that way. Otherwise, yeah. someone needs to get on my butt and chew my honey. Right. Let's go ahead and throw this disclaimer at disclaimer out. When we talk about you doing well or winning, we mean in the boundaries of honor and chivalry because we fight on a field of honor and chivalry, and that's the minimum standard for participating in the sport. We're not saying it every time we say do well or win or prowess because it's assumed that you are going to live up to that. And if you aren't going to live up to that, you shouldn't be on the field to begin with. To me, one of the things I love about our game is you trust your opponent. If I'm fighting Ulrich and Ulrich goes, hey, man, what about that shot? I'm going to call it because Ulrich, my friend Ulrich, I trust him. And if he asked me that he thought he hit me, okay, good, because I would much rather Ulrich and I sit down, drink, and be good that night than him be upset because I blew off a shot. Reminds me, I probably have to apologize to you about a crown list later. Um, <laughs> all right. No, there, there's a crown list later, later on in the in, on the on the Saturday show where you call a shot, and I did, I'm like I hit something behind your 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 shield. I, you ask me about it, and I'm like I think I hit something behind your shield, but I don't know what it was. And you being you, you call it. I go back and I watch the video, and I'm like, fuck, Yazi should never have called that. I didn't. I didn't hit nothing. I might have scraped something when I went by, but I don't know what that was. You won that fight anyway, but I felt horrible about it. Anyway, and now I'll tell you what: if it comes down to me winning a fight, I know. or keeping my friend Ulrich, that's that's no choice. You, you, no one's going to lose lose my friendship over missing a shot. That's not you know. Miss a bunch of them, and we'll talk. All right. So, right quick before we go on, when we say win a tournament, I know a lot of people who have gotten the prizes at an, at the end of a tournament that didn't win. For real. You know. There, there are times when you, I see the people walk out the field with that that prize. That prize may be a brand new hat, ah, but they didn't win the tournament. All right, so we got a hard one before we get to some of the populist the the live feed questions. Ah. I was going to go into the one about you don't have to be a, a, a squire. You can't get knighted if you weren't a squire, just so that we could that we could use the word sponsor, so that Yazi's word would get used. But I thought I'd throw that in there instead. <laughs> Just right quick, you don't have to be a squire to be to, to be a knight. There's plenty of plenty of them that weren't. Um, but the, here's the hard one: the whole recommend recommend recommended versus to the crown versus chosen by the crown, being held responsible by the populace of why? How did you guys make so and so a knight? Because that dude's a jackhole, right? Or Whatever the case may be, you know, knights are held to a pretty high freaking standard. All peers are held, held to a pretty high, high freaking standard. And there's a concept that we always choose who the, who a knight is, and that is not true. Um, or that guy went, you know, was close here and moved somewhere else and got knighted, and he turned and he turned out to be a jackhole. How could they have knighted him? 
we don't know. We 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 weren't part of their we weren't part of their their circle. You know, their crown may have just decided to knight them. Our crown may, may have just decided to knight somebody. But we're all held to that standard, right? We're all all held to to the same line because the populace doesn't know who 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 are put into what order by a claim of the the their peers or by decision by the sole sole decision by the crown. And some of those people are, are great folks, and that's fine. But you see someone get thrown out of the SCA, and they're like, "How how how has he ever made a knight?" We don't know that that person was made a knight by the order. You know, we don't know that the knights in that in that kingdom chose that person to be a knight. Their crown may have chosen that person to be a knight. So when you hold us all to that standard, all I'm saying is understand that all of us didn't say that necessarily. And if all of us did say it, then we have then, then we have a mea culpa to make. And if but if that person is a knight, we have a mea culpa to make anyway because it's our job to raise them up to our standard once they they get in if they didn't meet it before. But there's a, a level, this is a, a topic, not a myth, that people don't understand about that, right? They don't understand that, everyone everyone understands that the, the power lies in the crown. The crown can disagree with the, the, the order and put someone in that, the, that he, the order doesn't agree with or hold someone out that the, that the order does agree with. That's the crown's power. But they don't understand that when someone messes up. You understand what I'm trying to say? I know that was very convoluted, but well, good. What I'd like to say about that is when we meet and we discuss a candidate, you know, let's be honest. Anybody can be an awesome person for 48 hours at a time. Yep. Um, I'll be honest. I was in a meeting and there was a guy, an individual that was brought up and they passed. And I thought, what the hell just happened? This dude is pralings and dick. I mean, what, I mean, what was that? Mm -hmm. And to be fair, that person has been a fantastic night. And on the other hand, I was at a meeting. I'm like, oh God, we got to have that person here. What, what, what's taking so long? What, what the, why are we waiting? And then that person absolutely has done nothing with the belt. They they no longer play. When they were playing, they wound up being, you know, just aggressive and mean and then I'm like you can only do what you know about the person so whether it's the crown or whether it's our order mm -hmm. you know we are doing our best and we're human and we make mistakes and you know and, and you know people can be fooled and you know the idea is the theory is meridians and the, the way and the reason that we hold it strongly is that the judgment of 30 people or 40 people is superior to the judgment of one. Sorry, my dogs are going nuts. Um, but now, having said that, 40 people have, can be wrong and one person can be right. I'm not going to talk about the powers of the crown or whatever. But what it comes down to is just simply you do the best you can with the information you have. Boy, boy, those doggies. Man. Somebody feed them puppies. Yeah. I mean, what Yazi said, I, I got nothing really to add. <laughs> Just that one. Nope, that's fair. My dog Eric? barking. Now. So, I'm not going to lie. When people come to you and say, how did this happen? And you had nothing to do with it happening. You really want to go. Look, man, that wasn't me. I said my piece. But I and you eat the crow that you didn't hunt because you're trying to protect something greater. And that is the idea of a brotherhood. And I have really pretty strong opinions on this, and I'm not going to go too far afield on this because I could talk for a really long time about it. But to me, the most amazing thing about being elevated into the order of the chivalry 
was being a part of that Arthurian ideal of brotherhood, the round table, one among equals. And so when you encounter situations where the members of that round table think one way and the crown thinks another, you have no power against that. You must simply take it. And then you must do your best to defend the order in all the ways that you can, understanding that sometimes the crown could be right. I think it's less likely that the one is right and the 40 are wrong than the reverse, but it still can happen. But our ultimate, our job as knights is ultimately to be stewards of the society. And so sometimes we have to eat that crow that someone else hunted to keep the society a better place. And I don't like it. I suspect no one on this show likes it, but we do it because we want everybody else to have the dream, even if sometimes it gets tinged a little poorly by some action. All right, we got just a couple of uh, of the regular ones that are that are left. I covered the, and, and I, I think I'm gonna just say these right quick, and you guys just tell me if you disagree or not. All right, so I'm trying to get through this before before we lose the show. So you can't get knighted in Meridians if you weren't a member of the Sable Sword or the Legion of the Bear. Not true. Yeah, Kenneth was never a Sable Sword. Yeah, or um, God forbid. Yeah, Thomas, he wasn't a, a, a yeah. attorney fighter. What kind of anyway? <laughs> Sorry, Snowbear. Snow <laughs> Gunnar Snowbear was not not a member of either order. So, I I mean, it's just not true. Does it make it easier? Sure. Is is it required? Absolutely not. Um, and you that you actually have to play able to play chess, dan dance one dance, um, and do some, some kind of service and support. Uh, and it's not just all about prowess. That is absolutely true. You have to be able to do some of those things, and it's not just all about prowess. That you know, you've got to be able to do those things. It's called being being well well rounded. All right, live feed questions. How does one overcome the perception? This is I, I love this question, but how does one overcome the perception of she's good enough for a girl versus she's a good fighter, Charmone? Uh, I'm going to let you skip this one, Yazi. I figure. You thank you. I need more beer anyway. <laughs> uh, For the record, that, that's Yazi Squire. So, yeah. the question came out before is like, you know, about how many girls are knighted. I don't say girls. How many ladies are knighted? How many female knight? And I, and I don't look at it at the, as that. A fighter is a fighter is a fighter, regardless. Because they're out there fighting, and there's a bunch of them. There's a duchess out of uh, out of uh, Kalantir and a duchess who lives now in Australia who scare the pee water out of me, okay? And, well, Caramara, too. They, they scare me when I'm out there because they are – they butt wrap me all, all the time just to make me jump off the ground. And it's not about whether or not it's a girl. It's to overcome the perception she's good enough as a girl. Girl fighters are not girl fighters. Fighters are fighters. Period. You put on armor, you pick up a sword, you pick up a shield. As long as you don't pick up a Madu, we're okay. But outside of that, <laughs> <laughs> I had to get it in there. I had to get that one in there. Um, that one was wait, flat. How do you hit flat with a Madu? Anyway. 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 Back with prowess. You hit with the shaft. You hit with the shaft. <laughs> But as I look at it on the field, you got armor on, you got a shield, you got a sword, whatever you're fighting with, you're a fighter, period. There is no such thing as a girl fighter or a boy fighter. Sword that's hitting me doesn't have a gender. Yep. So I do have to tell a story on Ulrich on your squire. We were at a uh, silver hammer and we were doing melees at the end. And I had flanked Laylee and she had no idea I was there. So I reached out my glaive and I just kind of poked at her. And she lost her mind. 
You need to hit me. Just because I'm a girl doesn't mean you don't hit me. You treat me like the other fight. And she's just attack it, attack it, attack it. And then, you know, uh, the guy next to her goes, he did that to me too. He had us flanked. And then she went, oh, and just turned around and walked off. <laughs> so, you know, if you put the armor on, regardless of gender, they're out there fighting. And to treat them as anything other than a fighter is disrespectful. And to be honest, if you treat my squire as any other way, we're going to talk after she gets mad at you. I'm not going to hit you lighter just because you're a lady. I'm going to hit you just like I hit everybody or else. If you can't handle it. I went up the couldn't hit one hard enough, but that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have, a, I have a great story about that, but that's a different story. Um, so I do have, have a statement to make about, about this. And it, it kind of goes to what you said. By the way, I hope Lily apologized for you, to you for yelling at you. Oh, she um, did. No, oh, I figured she did. <laughs> I, I figured she would have. But um, so as, speaking as someone who has two, two squires who happen to be female, um, I've had some of these conversations before. Um, and we get in this thing, especially when we get into what I call training mode, where I want to hit you, especially in training mode, just as hard as I need to hit you to get you to call it. And I don't want to smoke you in training mode because that doesn't teach you anything or me anything. So a lot of times I've found that people think that I'm treating you know, male and female, that I'm being condescending when I do that. So it got me to do something early on in my fighting, which is the first two fights in the pickup. If we're doing a long set of pickups, the first two fighter fights are tourney level fights. So we can establish where we are. All right. Now, the next set of, set of fights are going to, going to be where I need to be to fight you for you to learn something out of this and me to be able to teach you something out of this. Now, if you don't want those fights, that's fine. Tell me that. And we'll just, we'll just go out and smoke each other and be done with it. Um, but I've often found that people think that you're fight, you're, you're being insulting when you, when you do that. And I think that's some of what happens um, with lesser skilled fighters in general, but um Sometimes um, female or handicapped or anyone who has, um, and I'm not trying to lump those in together, but people who have something that can add to the perception that you're treating them differently than you would anyone else um, can have that, uh, that sort of not chip on their shoulder, but that, that perception. So I always make sure that the first fights are, are, Full, are, are full on for the lack of a better term to keep that perception from happening that I'm trying to, to belittle them in any way. Um, it goes back to that whole, don't hit, don't hit me like, you know, hit me like I would anyone else. Now when we get out on the tourney field, that's different. We get on the tourney field. I've got to get through you. Cause I got to deal with Yazi in a little bit and I need to get past that before I can, I can go go because I want coffee at the end of the day and I can't get coffee unless I win the tournament. You want the prowess, huh? Absolutely. All right. You must have anything else on that before we go on? That's all I got to say about that. That's all I got to say about that. All right. A night marshal for a group. Is a night marshal for a group looked at negatively when they have to leave events early to go run pra practice? Absolutely not. Just tell people why you're leaving early. That was from Tyson, by the way. As the guy in Thor's Mountain that used to have to do that, um, I will say the only downside to that is sometimes you have, you have to leave, stick around for pickups as much as you can. I'm, I'm not saying that leaving early will, will, will you be looked at negatively, but if you can at all, stay for those pickup fights because a tournament is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Um, for me, where I learn the most about people and where they are is watching them fight a, ser a series of pickups. Now, we don't knight people for pickup fights, but it certainly lets us know where they are long term. So if you can stay for pickups, stay for pickups. Now, having said that, it's not going to be negative. You explain why and you leave. But if you can, stick around for pickups as long as you can. That would be my recommendation. Or another option is get somebody else to be the knight marshal in your area while you're easier said than done sometimes yeah i know sometimes yeah, you have to you're good to go 
I did that for the four years up until I was elevated and when I continued for a couple a year. But all you do is just tell people, like, because like you're you're doing it because you have a society obligation and you're doing the right thing. It may not be the thing that you want to do. And there's also an upside to it though, because if you do it right. You're fighting on Saturday, you're fighting on Sunday, sneaking a practice during the week, you got three days of fighting in that week. You can make some pretty good jumps then. But just like some people, if you leave early, think you can be a stick jock and you don't want to really take part in the SCA. So you do need to let people know why you're doing it. I'm of two minds on this. The second part of me is like, man, you got a life and you got stuff to do and that people need to understand that you got a life and you got stuff to do and they need to not jump to negative conclusions. However, knowing they're going to jump to those conclusions, just tell people it's all good. And another thing is don't underestimate the, the value to hanging out with people and having a good time and getting them getting to know you. I'm not saying it's going to be viewed negatively, but man, I got accused of being, of, you know, sucking up to the Knights, but it turns out I just liked some of those guys and I wasn't having a good time. And, you know, you, you miss some of the things, but if you're doing it for a job, yeah, just let people know. Yeah. All right. We're closing down on the end of the show. I think, uh, Eric, the next bit is yours. Uh -oh. First of all, let's go ahead and go over. Is there anything that you guys think that we missed that you'd like to cover that's of real importance? All right. I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> um, there was one earlier on that we didn't get to, which was, is there a minimum number of events you have to attend in a year? Dear God, no. Some There's there's a, one of the statements on there is you have to hit 30 plus events a year before they'll even talk about night of you. No, that's just... Travel helps. That's it. Travel helps because it gets you known better. It helps you build build your renown. It helps you build your your you know lets people see your face and see that you're out there trying. Uh, that's all. That's all that that does. But no, there's no no minimum number. If you you know you can do it by hitting a few events. Just make sure you hit the big events. If, if that's the case, if you have to to do a limited number of events, that's fine. Just make sure you hit the, you hit the big events. If you're always at the the big big tourneys, you'll get seen. It's fine. Um. So, shout outs. Are there any other shows you watch? Are there any people doing great things in the kingdom that you want to talk about? Um, is, is there any books that you've read that you want to, like, dude, you guys got to read this? Anything? Yeah, I, I got one. Have you seen the event site that Thomas Palmer is putting together up in East Tennessee? I've not seen it. I've heard about it. That thing is going to be fantastic when it happens and he is putting in the work and they are doing that and shout out to Danny DeWitten and that whole area. They are doing some good stuff out there. That is going to be a fantastic place for events in the future. And if you're going to do that, I got to also say, Hey, Dell, any people keep it going guys. Man. Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. the worst guy. I didn't talk too much. Um, no, I'm good. <laughs> Sorry. You're fine, man. Eric? So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to name any specifics, but I just want to give a shout out to all of our heavy and light fighters who have been doing their best to stay in shape for what is almost a year now. I know it's been a grind, and I specifically know that training for something when the when you don't know when you're going to get to put it into practice can be wearing and it can be hard to keep yourself involved in it. And I want to say, one, that we see you putting in the work. It's going to be reflected in how you perform when we come out of this. And three, those of you who haven't been doing it, Please, for the love of God, start stretching, start going for walks, start doing something, because I am really concerned that when we get back to heavy fighting, we're going to have a rash of soft tissue injuries if we don't. 
So um, among the regular shows that, that I, I tout, I'm just going to keep a, a short list tonight. Um, but uh, Coach's Corner is coming up tomorrow. And uh, they, uh, Duke Branos, uh, Viscount Tristan, um, uh, Duke Sean are always putting together good stuff. Uh, and um, uh, Viscount Sagan um, are always putting together good stuff about training. And it's, it's a different level of stuff, man. It really is. If you're if you're a fighter and you're interested in that, it's really a different level of stuff. Also, there's some Bardics tomorrow night. Um, and then there's Mr. Ellen here, who's always hosting socials, just stuff to keep the kingdom and the SCA in general uh, hooked in and uh, alive, and letting us all see each other's faces is a good thing. So uh, check those out when you get a chance. We'd like to thank our guests, Sir Mandan and Sir Astro, for joining us. We'd also like to thank her ladyship, Jessica Vosprey, for her graphics and showrunner magic. Her Excellency, Katarina, for keeping us on time. And boy, is that more work than you guys can imagine. And Mistress Adriana for her help with script writing, flow, and, and flow. And most importantly, you, you, the populace, our audience, for tuning in and joining us on this bonus episode. We really appreciate you joining us tonight. So make sure you join us on Monday for Defense. Where we'll be joined by... Um, Baroness uh, Izzy. The boys. Hey, Is it, no, hey, they're the voices. No. Hey, Just say quoi. And, quoi, that's right. And Nicholas Hildebrand, the master and the masters of defense, will be joined for. We'll be discuss. Wow, we'll discuss the order of defense and how they, how their meetings are run, their procedures, and what's discussed in them. Wow. <laughs> If you're watching live and you'd like to join us after the show for a chat or to hang out, then watch the Hound and Stag main page, the announcement page. We'll take a little break, about five minutes. After the show goes off the air, Graf and Katarina will post a link to the Zoom. We'll hang out and chat for about a half an hour. Then we'll close down so we can all go over and watch Duke Thomas and Count Bart over on Ask the Nights Live. Bonus points if you ask Bart difficult and embarrassing questions. Heckle them. All right. Finally, if you're watching the replay on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe up here. And if you're watching on or down here, sorry. And if you're watching on Facebook, like up here so that we can get the analytics going and we can get more views. All right. Thanks, everybody. This is a great show. We really appreciate you being here. Not everybody. Not really right. miss y'all. Oh, Midwinter. A. And if I die in battle, tomorrow I will be home, though it's 70 days march. To there from Rome, but a soul travels swiftly on the night wind. And if I die in battle, I'll be home again.